Thank you, Josh and Gabe. Appreciate it. Uh, seriously, Gabe, give those to Alan or Ron. Yeah, there you go. That's fine. Whoever. And uh, this matter of spiritual growth, let me go ahead and fess up. I'm not an authority on this. There are very few things I am an authority on. One is eating too much. I'm pretty much of an authority on that. But uh, This matter is not something I've mastered. And those of you who feel like you've reached full maturity in your spiritual lives, you may want to go to another class. I don't see anybody getting up running, so maybe we have a good chance of helping one another here. This is very personal, by the way. Spiritual growth is a very personal thing. I can't do it for you, and it's kind of between you and God. However, spiritual growth comes, some of which comes from associating with, a, Ron, are you trying to film this? Yeah. Where are you? Are you trying to film this? Man, that means I need to stand up here the whole time, doesn't it? All right. Well, if I'm not standing up here, you'll know I'm somewhere else, okay? All right. Has anybody not got a copy of the uh, thingy? Ron, would you fix them up? And Josh, do you still have some? Thank you, guys. Appreciate your helping. All right, hold your hands up if you need one and didn't get one. Michael, you need one. Don't act like you don't need one. <laughs> All right, very personal matter, this growing up in Christ. How many of you remember, Josh, you're probably young enough you can still remember this. Uh, did you ever have, uh, you do something you shouldn't have or was acting like you shouldn't and your daddy or mama said, why don't you grow up? Did they ever say that to you? I heard it way more times than I should have. That was my problem, my fault. And if you've ever heard that, you kind of were stung by that. Well, I'm fixing to say something to you right now. Brace yourselves. Why don't you grow up spiritually? Well, there are a number of hindrances that will get in our way. One of the biggest hindrances in growing spiritually is right here. Agree or disagree? By the way, you can argue with me at any point. You can ask questions. I probably won't know the answer, but you can ask them. I'll get Alan Kay to answer them for me. And um, so feel free to get involved in the discussion. And I cannot stand behind this. Well, I can, but it won't last long. Sorry about that. Maybe nobody wants to see me anyway. Now, prerequisites to spiritual growth is the beginnings of our spiritual lives. What do you do? You're converted. You hear the truth of God's word. You accept it as God's word. You believe that God is, that the Bible is his holy word. It is our guide in all things. And so you then begin to consider what is commanded of God and you go to the uh, New Testament. And by the way, we're going to use the Bible, okay? So be ready to turn and, and follow along and keep up with me and and uh, who knows, I may read it wrong or something, you'll have to correct me. But in the book of Acts, the church begins, Acts chapter 2. You're, you're aware of that, I imagine most of you are anyway. And on down in this course of uh, the, the chapter, Peter finishes up with a pretty uh, provocative statement. Uh, what does he say? Let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God hath made him both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom ye crucified. And he's accusatory, isn't he? He's making accusation. And indeed, they were responsible, many of them, even directly. And so, in this instance, the church has been born. It's, it's come in the uh, time of the Roman Empire. It's come as had been prophesied again and again. And so here it is. Now, these people who... In just another verse or so there, very next verse in fact, that it says they were cut to the heart. They were pricked in their heart. And they said, in essence, okay, you've convinced us. What do we do? Now that's not quite the exact words that you read there, but they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? So, did you notice that Peter didn't tell them they need to hear the word of God and, and believe? Did you notice that? 
I've had people bring that up to me and say, well, nobody, they didn't, weren't told that. Well, that's a good point. Is it perhaps that they had heard all about Jesus just in the last few minutes or however long Peter had been preaching? And they had been convinced that he was the Christ or they would not have been provoked to ask this question? You ever thought about that? I think that's a reasonable understanding of this. And then in verse 38, it says, Peter told them to repent and be baptized for the remission or forgiveness of their sins. Then in verse 41, he says, they, they then that received his word were baptized. The King James says that gladly received his word were baptized. And there were added unto them, or added in that day about 3,000 souls. The truth is they were added to the charter members. Who were they? The apostles. They were the ones that uh, were the beginning point. And so these people were the first of converts. All right, look at chapter 3, verse 19. By the way, I probably have overkilled on some of these uh, points here, so just bear with me. We'll move rapidly through it. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Repentance is specifically mentioned again, the idea of changing heart, will, and mind, and conduct in order that you might have your sins taken away. Chapter 8, we have the story of the Ethiopian nobleman. He had been to worship. He was a godly man. He's on his way back. He's reading from Isaiah. The Spirit directs Philip to join himself to the chariot. He teaches him about Jesus from the very passage that he was reading. He said, there's water. What's keeping me from being baptized? And Peter said, if you believe, then you can do that. And so we have a, have a very important uh, illustration here of someone being converted. Interesting to me is they got out of the chariot, went down to the water, and they baptized him. This may not be the first time we read about baptism in the New Testament, but it's one of those examples, very specific, about one that obeyed the gospel and wanted to be saved and wanted to make things right with God. Then in chapter 26, and I had a reason, I'm sure, for putting this down. What does 26.18 say? Oh, yeah. Uh, to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive remission of sins and an inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith in me. Jesus had in mind for us to believe that he was a Christ that's under the living God and admit to that faith. There are other places that we could look at in regards to this matter of conversion. Uh, one I want to specifically mention here is 1 Corinthians 1. You're familiar with the context there. Paul is writing to the church of God at Corinth and he talks about um, how that there was strife amongst them. Some of you say you're of Apollos and you're of uh, whoever and some of Christ. Interestingly, this expression, I am of the, the idea of I of Christ really literally means belonging to. I, I belong to this one. And the point is, Christ was the only one that was crucified. Christ is the one in whose name, into whom we're baptized. And so this is a significant point, I think, in regard to the matter of conversion, the description of conversion. Now, what action do we take? Well, we must first realize that we're in sin, don't we? Before you become a Christian, before you are baptized, you know the faith in Christ is necessary. And we've mentioned repentance a couple of times. It's also urgent that we admit to our faith, confess it, speak out the same. That's what confession means. And so then immersion is specifically mentioned. And it's also by Jesus described as being done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know it's for the forgiveness of sins. And so we first must realize that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So what's the problem? It's a sin problem, isn't it? Sin is, we'll get to this probably again in a little bit, but sin separates us from God. Our need is to get rid of the sin and in conversion, you remove the sin so that you can be reconciled, brought back into a right relationship with God. And then in uh, chapter six, Romans chapter six, what do we have there? Verses one and two. What shall we say then? Is that how that begins? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We who died to sin, how shall we any longer live therein? 
I think that uh, verse 23, let's see why I wrote that down. The wages of sin is death. There's that spiritual death, which we're going to talk about some more in a minute. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, I believe Ephesians 2, 1 says. So, what must we do? By the way, if you're sitting there thinking, we know all of this already. This is nothing new. Well, good. I'm glad you know this, all of this. That's wonderful. That's a good thing. But this idea of dying to sin is a concept that I think some people just miss uh, sometimes. I really have felt like that on occasion. The concept of sin, and by the way, I've tried to give you practically everything I've thought of, and I wrote it down and, and give it to you in the notes so you can go back and study this some more later. The idea of sin is... Uh, comes from a word that's translated transgression, uh, but in this chapter six of Romans, it means to fall short, to miss the mark. And in chapter six, it's also, sin is also identified as a power that governs. It talks about sin reigning in our mortal bodies, sin ruling in our lives. So death, we've mentioned this already, but death is separation. Separate wages of sin is death. We don't want spiritual death, do we? That's separation from God. Physical death, we understand that. It's the separation of soul and body, James 2, 26, and these other passages that are mentioned there. But spiritual death is a separation of man from God because of sin. What does Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 tell us? Sins have separated uh, you from your God. Your iniquities have hid his face from you. Words to that effect. Is that what it says? And that's very, very significant uh, point here. We must realize this is what sin does. It separates us from God. Now, to be a Christian, we must die to sin. Anyone want to try to define that word or that phrase for me? I think I do it there very clear, very clearly. Anyone want to say it out loud? Separate yourself from sin. To give up sin. Be separated from the love and practice of sin, one writer said. And I think that's pretty accurate. We don't become a Christian and then still continue in sin. Uh, we could use the illustration of the hog that gets taken out of the walla, out of the mire and he's washed off and, and you turn him loose, where does he go? Right back in there. Well, that's not real repentance, is it? <laughs> he didn't really repent, did he? Well, when we leave sin or when we obey the gospel, we're supposed to come away from sin, leave sin, and have no more part in it. Let me share a few things with you that's not in your notes and I, that I think this could be profitable to us. When we confess Jesus as Lord, as Romans 10 tells us we should, Romans 10, 9 and 10, this in one way demands that we stop sinning. I can't be subject to Christ as my Lord and Master and then continue in that, that which is totally contrary to His way and His will. Sin is contrary to his nature. He knew no sin, 1 Peter 2 and verse 22. All have sinned. We've mentioned this, uh, Romans 3, verse 10 and verse 23. And if we say we have no sin, we ain't fooling anybody but ourselves. That's a misquote of 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. So we know that we all sin. But when we obey the gospel, we die to the practice of sin when we repent and turn from them. We die to the rule or the control of sin when we're baptized into the death of Christ. Sin no longer has dominion over us. This doesn't mean we'll be sinless. We'll still be subject to temptation. We might still stumble and fall, but generally speaking, our intent and purpose is not to sin if we've truly obeyed the gospel. Now, why shouldn't we sin? Excuse me, reasons not to sin. Number one, we've died to sin. We've put it out of our life. We've no longer in the, under the control of it. We've put off the old man. Uh, Colossians chapter three, verse nine, uh, really is a good chapter where it talks about taking off the old way. 
and then you put on the new man. And that's a, that's a concept that's biblical and one that we need to consider a reason not to sin. We've removed the old man. We've put off the body of the flesh, Colossians 2, verse 11. And then he uses the expression about a circumcision that involves uh, putting off the life of fleshly indulgence. It's a metaphor. It's not a physical circumcision, as was the practice of the Jews, but it's a circumcision of the heart, Romans 2, verse 29. So we, another reason not to sin is that our life is hid with Christ in, uh, hid, our life is hid with Christ, Colossians 3, verse 3. And we, Paul said, he had been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2, 20. And so I think these are reasons enough not to sin. The reason to live for Christ is we've been raised together with him. We are alive unto God, Romans 6, verse 11. We have put on the new man. I mentioned Colossians 3 a while ago, verse 10. And Paul said in Galatians 2, 20 that not only had he been crucified with Christ, but Christ now lives in me. So, Christians, we have something set before us, don't we? A challenge to live as God would have us to live. Now look on down with me right under the, I know this doesn't, well, anyway, the typist, just be thankful there are no, probably no typos in it. The orderliness of it is my fault and nobody else's. But Christ died for our sins, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, that we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Also, the action that we take when we obey the gospel is an obedient response. It's a faith-filled response. We are, how did Paul put it, Romans 6, we were baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his death, we were buried therefore with him through baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. Then in Galatians 3, 26, 27, you know that's the passage that says we're all sons of God by faith in Christ. For as many of you has been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It's we've clothed ourselves in him. So all of these expressions describe the action that we take. We were dead to sin. We now must die to sin. We must become righteous in obedience to his, his will and uh, follow his instruction as what he's required of us to get rid of sin. Now, what happens? Number one, what does Ephesians 2, 1 tell us? And you did he make alive when you were dead through your trespasses and sins. Do you feel like you're alive spiritually? I don't, I don't, it's not a feeling so much, but if, do you think of yourself, maybe that's a better way to put it, of being alive spiritually? Well, when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, you were separated from God, you had no spiritual life until you, in obedient response, did what God told you to do in order to get rid of your sins and become his, uh, his uh, servant, his follower. So we're made alive. We're new creatures. Second Corinthians chapter, do I have it? Five and verse 17. We're made new in Christ, made new creatures. We're released from sin. I didn't write down Acts 22, 16, but you remember Paul recounting his conversion. He was told by Ananias to arise and be baptized and what? Wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so we're released from sin. Uh, back to Romans chapter 8. Anybody have it? 8.1. There's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. So we understand this. We're made righteous. This is an important thing. What is righteousness? Carl, what do you think? 119 something. Yeah, you got about 911 verses to pick from there, but uh, yeah. All of God's commandments are righteous. We're made righteous in that we are made right. I know that's oversimplification, but we're made right in the sight of God and in compliance with His terms of pardon. Uh, 
Philippians 3. Let's just read that since I can't call it up. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Yea, verily, I, and I count all things to be lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things and do count them but refuse, that I may gain Christ to be found in him, not having a righteousness of mine own, even that which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So we have a righteousness of God or from God. It's not me doing being a perfect uh, person that uh, can justify myself by my own righteousness. But we're made righteousness in Christ. Now, the spiritual blessings that are mentioned, especially uh, as they are noted one after the other in Ephesians chapter 1, they're all ours to enjoy in Christ. And remember Galatians 3, 26, 27, especially verse 27, we're baptized into Christ. So we're in Christ when we obey the gospel, when we're baptized. And where are the spiritual blessings? Look at it with me. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning of verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing, in the heavenly places in Christ, or in the heavenly realm. Now verse 4, even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love, having foordained us unto adoptions as, as sons through Jesus Christ unto himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, uh, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved, in whom we have our redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Now, I may have not counted them all, but that's several spiritual blessings. Where are they? Not outside Christ, but in Christ. And so we as Christians, a result of becoming a Christian, we enjoy all spiritual blessings. All things become new. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, so a new name is given. Isaiah 62 verse 2 is a prophecy promising that God would call his people by a new name, and sure enough he did. Galatians chapter 3 We've already referred to more than once, but this is a new relationship. We're sons of God, children of God. And, and because of that, we are brother and sister as children of God. We're brothers and sisters in the family of God. And that's a concept that we need to fully understand and realize how valuable and important that is. We have a new code of conduct. Go with me, Galatians, Ephesians. Let's look at Philippians chapter 1 just for a moment. This I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in all knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and void of offense unto the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are through Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. Verse 27 says... Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or be absent, I may hear of your state, that you may stand fast in one spirit with one soul striving for the faith of the gospel. We're to do all the will of God. Chapter 2, verse 15 suggests, well, look at verse 14. Do all things without murmuring and questionings that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom ye are seen as lights in the world. Think about this. We're to do all the will of God without question, complaining and questioning that we may be blameless, that's free from any legitimate fault, harmless, unmixed with corruption, without blemish, that's noble in reputation and character, which would make you unique, special, in a crooked and perverted generation. The English Standard Version translates that twisted generation. I found that interesting. A generation uh, that is twisted and, and crooked. And in that, we would reflect the light of Christ. We would not be the light, but we reflect the light of Christ in this dark world of sin. All right. 
look at then the next one, the new object of our affection. Our sights are set on things above, aren't they? We have uh, Galatians, I mean, uh, excuse me, Colossians chapter 3. If we're raised together with Christ, referring back to our obeying the gospel and being raised from the water of the grave of baptism. We're to seek the things that are above. That's where our focus needs to be. That's our new object of affection. Uh, new focus, Matthew 6 verse 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom, and all these things shall be added. Put the kingdom first in all the things we do, all decisions and all deeds. And we are blessed with, uh, with a new choice. Romans 6 verses 16 we're all under the control of someone or something. That's a point he makes there in Romans chapter 6. But instead of saying, choose whether you're going to serve God, he says, you need to, you're need you going to serve something, so choose whom you will serve. And he said, we were servants of Satan under the power or the dominion of sin, but now when we become Christians, we're serving God. As verse 16 says, obedience unto righteousness, or leading to righteousness. We are servants of righteousness, verse 18. And so this is vital to understand all of these things about our beginnings uh, of growing in Christ, becoming a Christian, our conversion, how it's done, what, what's involved, the results that are, that are found uh, in the scripture that tells us what our results are in our obedience to the gospel. Let me put a peg down now. You're supposed to know all of that already, right? So we flew through it. Now we're going to take our time and begin to discuss these things about growing. I, I say again, this is a very personal thing. You've got to choose to grow spiritually. You've got to choose to become more Christ-like in your life. You've got to decide. And then you've got to renew that commitment on a daily basis. It's just like I have to do and everybody else has to do. We all are accountable before God individually. I'm responsible before God. We start out as a babe. Gladys and I were somewhere today and, oh, I know it was in Walmart. Well, yes, we're deplorables, Walmart shoppers. <laughs> anyway, all of a sudden, wah, 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 she says, her mother ears perked up and I hadn't even noticed she says, I hear a tiny baby. And sure enough, it was a month, one month old, and it was not happy. That child was not happy. And the closer we got, the easier it was to find them. I mean, because that kid was going wide open, and they were not happy. What does that child want? One of two or three things. Either to be changed, to be fed, or what else? Be held, or, or to sleep, maybe? That pretty much covers it, doesn't it? But uh, we, when we start out as uh, Christians, new Christians, we are indeed babes in Christ. We're children of God, but we're little babies. Now, we don't want to stay that way. Don't, don't want to do anything that would stunt our growth spiritually, do we? So look at this. We start out as babes to grow and mature spiritually. It's a growth process that uh, Paul and Peter describe in such a way that it parallels or is compared or contrasted to physical life. When we first start out as babies, what do we need? The milk. First Peter chapter 2, verse 2 talks about we need to long for, earnestly desire the spiritual or sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Paul writes to um, the church at Corinth, I can't talk to you like mature Christians. You're still needing baby food as it were. You're still needing to be fed with a bottle, so to speak. And he's, uh, he's not being, he don't mean that as a compliment. They should have been growing more spiritually. So we understand this is a growth process. It's similar to the physical life. And it takes time. When you go to Hebrews 5 and in verse 12, he says, for when by reason of time ye ought to be teachers. He's saying, in other words, over time, you were a babe in Christ, you should have matured and grown spiritually to the point where you were able to teach others. But instead, you have need someone teach you the rudiments of the first principles are of God. You've got to be spoon-fed the baby food still. And that's not the way it's supposed to be is the point of the Hebrews writer. So, this growth takes time. Spirituality, by the way, I don't even think that's a Bible word, but we're going to use it, throw it around a little bit. 
A lot of people think of spiritual uh, nature characteristic in a person is a result of a direct operation or pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon people today. If you don't, haven't heard that, you just had not got around much. Many, many of your religious friends believe that in order for them to be sure of their salvation or in order for them to uh, realize that they're in God's favor, they must receive a, a, a direct operation of the Holy Spirit to come upon them that they might do other things and have special uh, uh, solutions, easy solutions to their problems and so on. Spirituality is not sentimentality or emotionalism. I have some acquaintances right now that they get all worked up in their religious services and they're just carrying on and they're just all caught up in emotionalism. And in their mind, that means they are spiritual. That If you were to ask them to identify what is spiritual, they would, they would say that is the, the evidence or the proof that they are spiritual. Spirituality or being spiritual is not to be confused or identified with mysticism. I knew what it meant, I thought, but I decided to look it up. I'm going to give you a book definition. Mysticism is belief in the possibility of attaining direct communion with God or a God or knowledge, uh, a knowledge of spiritual truth greater than others. Similarly, spirituality is not superior piety or a level of righteousness attained by only a select few. And I think we need to point this out because so many in our uh, world today believe that they are very spiritual people and they're basing it on one of these things that is contrary to what God's word teaches spiritual is. Look at the next page or on the back, I guess. On the back. Spiritual is used in contrast with fleshly and carnal. In God's word, more than once, in several places, in the New Testament, the fleshly is, is uh, in contrast to spiritual. Carnal is another word that's used. Carnal-minded means worldly, the idea of that, uh, that they're worldly. If, if we're going to understand what it is to be spiritual, we realize, need to realize it's the opposite of the fleshly way of things. It's opposite of the carnal or worldly way of things. Spiritual is just used in describing things that originate with God, His law. Uh, Romans 7, 14 describes His law as that which is spiritual. Things related to things revealed by the Holy Spirit, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 13, were spiritual. And it's also used in regard to men who follow after spiritual things. I want us to look at several of those verses. Go with, go with me to Romans 8 and verse 5. For they that are after the flesh, notice that, mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Okay? Now, look at 1 Corinthians 2.15. Let's see what that says. 2.15, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, and he himself is judged of no man. So the person... The person that is uh, spiritual is the one that, is, uh, that judges all things, knows God's will. Look now at uh, chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, as unto babes in Christ. Then 14, verse 37. What does that tell us? If any man thinketh, thinketh himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him take knowledge of the things which I write unto you, that they are the commandments of the Lord. If somebody's claiming they're prophetic, they have prophetic power, or they're spiritual, take consideration of what God is, uh, God's word is, God's teaching, what things I've been teaching you that are the commandments of the Lord. That's how you determine, determine whether they were spiritual or not. And then Galatians 6, 1, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. All right, time is going to play out real fast here. Spiritual growth is a maturation process. It involves maturing. Uh, in our physical 
lives. We have to mature. We begin as a tiny baby and we grow up and, and mature in our lives. Hopefully we mature in other ways. God expects his children to grow and mature spiritually. Men in Christ who walk so as to please God are spiritual and cannot, and I, like to, I would like to have changed this word. I wish I had before I typed it, but stagnant. Is that a word that you understand why I use that word? If you remain stationary, if you remain in the same place, you're not advancing, you're not moving on, and that's, that's not what we need. If we're going to grow spiritually, we can't stay in the same place. I've known people who obey the gospel, baptized into Christ, attended service of the church, uh, regularly did, were uh, positively good and, and not doing anything really bad, but they weren't growing at all. They were stagnant. They were just stationary. They were like they were five years later. They hadn't, hadn't grown a bit. And I'm sure you've seen that. You may have even seen it in yourself. We don't, this is not time for confession, but you know what I'm saying. So, what we need to do is realize that God expects us to grow and grow spiritually. Jesus is our example. How did he increase? In wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. He grew in every way. He developed. He advanced in every way. He's our example. I realize that's talking about uh, the physical side of it. But he also grew in the knowledge of the will of God. He was about his father's business, wasn't he? At age 12 in Jerusalem. And so he was growing in favor with God even there. That's the spiritual side of it. Now, Christians are to grow together unto a holy temple in the Lord. Ephesians 2, 20 through 22. The, Thess the Thessalonians' faith grew. According to 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3, their love abounded, he said, I believe, right before that, and said, and their faith grew more and more. Christians are urged to grow in what? The grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that what Peter said, 2 Peter 3, 18? Now, one of the most important verses in this whole list here, I think, is Hebrews 6, 1, talking about pressing on unto perfection. He's not talking about sinlessness here. He's talking about full growth or full maturity in the spiritual life. We're to grow up in all things into him, Ephesians 4 and verse 15. We'll pick up at this point next time. We're about to hear the second bell. Do you have any questions or comments? Did I bore you silly? I hope not. Hope you stayed with me. I maybe need to put chargers in the seat so every few minutes give you a little bzzz, so you'd pay attention a little more. I don't know. Maybe that's not the answer. Thank you for being here. I hope you'll be back next uh, Wednesday evening for the class that you'll bring others with you. And we'll just continue to have a good class and learn better how to grow spiritually. A lot of good stuff that we need to know about. And the Bible has, is replete with good teaching to help us to know what God wants us.